Good evening, and welcome back to another episode of Lethal Company Concepts. The first episode did very well, and I absolutely loved making it, so I figured, why not do it again? If you haven't seen the first episode yet, I suggested a bunch of ideas for new scrap pieces, new equipment, changes to the creatures, some of which were actually taken, presumably, presuming Zeker saw it, he probably didn't, but either way, I also suggested a bunch of new creatures, that's what this one's going to be focusing on. So just like last time, I've created some items and creatures, but this time I'm not going to be suggesting changes to the in-game creatures, and I'm also going to be presenting some ideas for new moons. Just like last time, I got artists from my community to draw these ideas out. They're credited in the bottom left when their art appears, and their links are in the video description. Make sure you go and check them out if you like what you saw. Anyways, let's not waste any more time and get right into the concepts, starting with the new items. Our first item is the camera. So to admit, I kind of stole this idea from the top comment on my last video by Jacob Arufat7840, presuming I'm pronouncing that correctly. So thank you for your suggestion. I stole it. It's mine now. Anyways, the camera is a piece of company equipment purchasable from the store at around $15. It's a cheap disposable plastic camera good for five photos. You can snag photos of anything. The camera even comes with a flash to illuminate dark areas. If you get a good enough photo of an interesting thing occurring, you can get some money from it. Monsters in particular give a lot if photographed, with prices scaling depending on the danger of the monster photographed, amount of monsters photographed, and a few other factors like rooms it was taken in or proximity to the exit. Additionally, you can take photos of scrap too and sell those, which also scale depending on the rarity of the scrap taken, amount of scrap in the photo, and a few other factors. These photos can either be pinned up on a corkboard in your ship if you get some funny ones, or sold to the company for some extra cash. Once the camera is exhausted of photos, though, it's nothing more than useless trash, not even sellable to the company for anything useful. Anyways, next up is the carving knife. Also bought from the company store, the carving knife is a short-ranged melee weapon with less damage than the shovel, but a much higher attack rate. This lower range makes killing something with the carving knife rather difficult and finicky, but that's honestly not its main usage. The main utility of the carving knife comes in corpses. By holding the interact key with a knife out, the employees holding it can carve off trophies from creatures that actually leave behind a corpse. Things like eyeless dog teeth, thumper hide, spider silk, hoarding bug eyes, and more can be obtained with the carving knife. Each one of these trophies sells for a unique price, but generally the harder the kill is, the more expensive the trophy will end up being, with higher tier trophies like eyeless dog teeth being nearly quintuple the price of lower tier trophies like snare flea mandibles. If you already have a shovel on the team, bringing along a carving knife might be a nice way to ensure your team some extra rewards in their fights. Next up is incense. A hard-to-utilize item bought from the company store, the incense finds its main utility in the warding off of dangerous paranormal threats. The incense is useless when not activated, but upon being activated it will let loose a fragrance that wards off paranormal evil, causing creatures like the ghost girl and another creature mentioned later in the video to vanish while it is active, and causing the effects of cursed scrap, a category of items I'll get into right after this entry, to be nullified. The radius of the incense is rather large, but it is quite expensive and requires an employee to hold it out to achieve its full effect. The complete duration of the incense is 5 minutes, making it a nice emergency tool if paranormal threats stand between you and your quota. Now we enter into the next three items I came up with, all belonging to the aforementioned category of cursed scrap. Cursed scrap items are odd pieces of scrap found primarily on harder moons, they are universally high-tier scrap that all come with odd side effects that surround them. There are only two pieces of scrap that are currently in the game that I would put in this strange new category, and they would be the comedy and tragedy masks. Cursed scrap effects are unique and can all be negated by the incense if it is active. But anyway, let's get started with our first one, the Screamer. A seemingly living piece of quote-unquote scrap that can be sold nonetheless. The Screamer is found rarely, and always appears to be sleeping. If an employee ever picks up the strange disc-shaped organism, it will emit an ear-splitting screech constantly that will cause all employees in a small radius around it to begin to see red as the noise slowly wears away at them. 
After a while, the noise will even begin to damage the employees at a rate which increases the longer they stay in the radius. On the bright side, while it is screaming, all other monsters will leave you alone. They don't like the noise either. However, if you really are tired of hearing the thing scream in your ear constantly, there's a simple solution. Put it down and whack it with a shovel or knife. This will shut it up for about 30 to 60 seconds before it will begin to scream again. While easily negligible, a screamer can be annoying as all hell, and some teams might even find it easier to just leave them behind if they don't feel like babysitting it all the way back to the ship. Our second piece of cursed scrap is the Odd Bone. A sinister artifact, the Odd Bone is a femur that constantly emits a blackened mist from the grooves and symbols carved into it. The Odd Bone only shows its cursed nature when picked up for the first time. The employee that is holding the bone will have two to three random misfortunes placed upon them for as long as they hold it in their inventory. These misfortunes include slowing your movement speed, a constant black fog that obscures your vision, turning out the power in the facility, opening and closing doors around the employee, increasing the weight of the bone to a ridiculous amount, causing random auditory or visual hallucinations, and even causing the holder to lose their ability to see or hear other players. This makes the Odd Bone a massive trial to get back to the ship, but luckily it grants a very high reward when sold, making it worthwhile for a competent team to try and escort it back at high priority. Though do be wary on solo runs, it might be damn near impossible to get it back safely. Our final piece of cursed scrap are the Mysterious Organs. A series of strange biological samples, the mysterious organs can be found resting in corners of rooms and are sometimes in the middle of hallways. They appear alive, pulsing and gurgling while they're held, and even sometimes moving around when left alone for too long. Their cursed nature is obvious, but it becomes even more obvious when it is actually picked up, as the noises the organs make act like a beacon to all nearby monsters causing every creature in the facility to be made aware of the exact location of the holder of the organs every few seconds. This can be incredibly dangerous for the more aggressive creatures like thumpers, mast employees, and nutcrackers, but the task doesn't end as soon as they're in the ship, as they can still move when placed down, meaning someone in the truck may need to keep a close eye on them to make sure they don't escape in the middle of a run. However, Despite the danger, these are possibly the most valuable pieces of scrap in the game, as Jeb loves the taste of these grotesque specimens, and will reward you handsomely if they're brought to him successfully, alongside a satisfied burp. Anyways, those were all the item ideas I had. Now it's time to move on to the suggestions I had for two new moons. First off, the Oceanic Cetus. A mid-tier moon alongside March and Offense, Cetus is a mostly oceanic moon, with the few land masses that poke above the sea only being accessible during low tide. Cetus boasts a unique interior layout. Gaps and deep rooms are now flooded and covered in barnacles. The bunker here is difficult to navigate, with constant wading through waist-high water being needed in lower rooms. The interior spawns here are relatively easy compared to March and Offense, but it is still filled with opportunistic predators looking for a meal while the water is low. A notable spawn here are the Ningyo mentioned in my last Concepts video, aquatic predators that hunt anything that fall into their body of water with the voracity of piranhas. Cetus, luckily, has damn near zero outside spawns, but to make up for this lack of danger, as time passes, the moon will slowly begin to flood, including the interior of the bunker, making it imperative to get in and out quickly before the tide rolls in and washes your entire team away. Our second moon is Hephaestus. A hellish volcanic moon, Hephaestus serves as an alternative to Titan. Where Titan is cold and desolate, with tons of dangerous creatures spawning outside and a short walk to the main entrance, Hephaestus is searing hot, with the main difficulties outside being treacherous terrain and a long trek to the main entrance. Hephaestus is covered in jagged red rocks, with distant volcanoes bellowing smoke into the air that covers the sky and rains ash down upon all solid terrain. Employees will have to navigate rivers of magma and winding thin paths up harsh rocky outcrops. A lucky few organic creatures exist outside, but inside is another story entirely. Everything wants to take refuge from the heat, 
and everything is hungry. Meaning the bunker is filled with all the most dangerous creature spawns. Though Hephaestus has a specifically high chance for spawning inorganic threats, like turrets and mines, worryingly often. Hephaestus also has a very high chance of spawning a brand new bunker layout, but we'll get to that near the end of the creatures segment. Speaking of which, the creatures segment. Starting out with the corpse flies. Our first creature of this video, the corpse flies are flying white butterfly-esque insects that hide in massive numbers in dark warm spots in the facility while waiting for their food. Their most distinguishing feature is easily their stark white pigmentation, which leads to them sticking out amidst the dark colors of the bunker. A corpse fly's main business is the consumption of, you guessed it, corpses. When an entity dies in a bunker, and is left alone for long enough, it will begin to attract corpse flies, which will begin to flock onto the flesh and try to feed on the rich blood and flesh of the recently deceased creature. Once enough corpse flies have gathered around a corpse, it starts to get dangerous, as the corpse flies will begin to swarm and bite at any creatures that get too close to their food source. This includes employees trying to carry out their dead friends, or trying to carve trophies off of corpses with a knife. The easiest way to counter these pests is to simply drag the corpses of your friends outside before the flies begin to swarm. After a long enough time, the flies will finish their meal, and the corpse will be reduced to nothing but a worthless heap of pulp, of no use to anyone. Our next creature are the Wayfarers. An employee wandering outside at night may notice something shining in the far distance, like a will-o'-wisp dancing amidst the forest or glowing out in the tundra. Upon approaching it, however, they will be met with the Wayfarer a floating jellyfish with a bell that glows like a lantern. They are relatively harmless when left alone, but if one gets a bit too close to it, they may come out with a nasty sting that deals a solid chunk of damage. The main threat of the wayfarers comes as day turns to night, and more begin to appear. Upwards of 10 to 20 wayfarers can spawn on a map at a time, and they are drawn to other sources of light. This is usually harmless grouping behavior, but then you may remember that your ship has a rather large light source atop it. As it happens, wayfarers will often find themselves grouped in tight proximity around the outside of your ship, forming a strange ring around it. The easiest way to prevent this from happening is to turn off the lights in your ship as night approaches, which will cause less wayfarers to swarm your ship at once. Employees making their way back might find it tough to navigate past the swarm in order to get to the ship without being stung to death. Worst case scenario, you can always use a shovel to trade hits with the Wayfarer, as their gelatinous forms go down easily in a mere two shovel swings, meaning you can carve your way back to the ship if you have the health to spare. Next up, the Radiators. Another paranormal entity, like the Ghost Girl, the Radiators are strange apparitions appearing like human nervous systems suspended in glowing green ectoplasm. They spend the vast majority of their time not manifesting themselves physically. However, every once in a while they will appear out of nowhere. Now luckily they mean you no harm, and are intensely curious as to the nature of these strange fleshy things that they haven't seen before. They will only watch you, standing completely still for a few seconds before demanifesting and leaving you alone for a bit. They will never directly attack, even if you run up to them and try to hit them with a shovel. Unfortunately, the radiators have a trait that makes a long visit in their line of sight a bad idea. Radiators, as their name suggests, constantly emit deadly radiation while manifested granting a lethal dose to any employee that stands close to them for a long enough period of time. In-game, this functions as a simple damage over time radius that intensifies with proximity to the radiator. A radiator will only damage things in its line of sight, so ducking around a corner until it is gone is the best way to avoid its ionizing presence. Realistically, radiators don't serve as too big a danger on their own, but when they manifest out of nowhere while you're trying to deal with other creatures or if you're battling the clock, they can be a massive hindrance. If only your body could withstand them, I'm sure they'd love to communicate. Next up, the Tar Stalker. A deadly hunter, the Tar Stalker is elusive and found only in the darkest corners of medium and hard moons. 
They appear as massive quadrupedal predators, with several biological features in common with carnivorous worms and leeches. Their skin is incredibly sensitive to light, so they constantly produce a pitch black slimy tar to cover itself. This tar is how it gets its name, as well as its hunting mechanisms. Though this tar is also the only way that one can detect the presence of a tar stalker before they see it. A tar stalker's domain is marked with black stains on the walls and ceilings, and amidst those hallways is where it will spend most of its time in a dormant state, resting with its body hugged tight to walls and ceilings in hopes that nothing sees it while it slumbers. Most employees will never actually encounter this creature, as it will only hunt in pitch black dark areas. If the employees wander around in dark places for too long, or god forbid the power is switched off either by removing the apparatus or through the breaker box, the tar stalker will begin its hunt, extruding a massive toothy mouth and beginning to sniff around for its prey. It hunts in a vaguely similar way to a bracken, looking for opportunities to charge the hapless employees in order to tear them apart with its teeth. However, a smart employee in this situation can counter a tar stalker by shining their flashlight down the creature's mouth, shocking the exposed skin with a bright light and causing the creature to flee briefly. One might be inclined to wave their flashlight around like mad when they're being hunted, but this is a bad idea, as the tar stalker has learned to deal with prey that utilizes its aversion to light against it. The tar stalker, when a flashlight is kept on it for too long, will try out a second attack option. It will retract its mouth back into its body and charge towards its prey, not caring whether they have the flashlight on or not, tackling them and devouring them when it has its prey pinned down. However, the mouth structure the tar stalker extrudes from its body also contains the eyes and nose, meaning that while doing this attack and for a brief period after, the tar stalker loses all senses besides touch. A smart employee can play the tar stalker's game for as long as they like, or they can bait it to charge and sprint away while it is dazed after missing its attack. It is entirely possible to kill a tar stalker, but it is not recommended. They are fast and elusive. Oftentimes, one will have to bait multiple charges to get enough hits in to kill a tar stalker. It might be best to simply avoid the dark rooms. Our second to last creature are the Clockwork Angels. One might wonder when landing on a moon just what they're looking at when they leave their ship. A mysterious, massive statue made of metal gears and stone chunks woven together to a humanoid shape, with gargantuan wings made of rusted metal sheets stitched together over a framework. These statues can be found all around any moons. Oftentimes, up to four of them can spawn at once, all frozen in place, often flocked around by manticoils as they rust, unmoving in the daylight. However, don't be fooled by their apparent passivity. The clockwork angels are the apex predators of the night. When the sun sets, there's a notable chance that one of the statues that has spawned will begin to move, creaking as its gears whir to life again, and it wanders the landscape looking for creatures, any creatures, to exterminate. The artificial colossus possesses a powerful bloodlust for the death of all life. It will kill eyeless dogs, threaten away forest guardians, slaughter entire packs of baboon hawks, and even leave hives bereft of their protective circuit bees. A clockwork angel's main weapon is its now blinding eye beacon a powerful supernatural weapon that causes all caught in the bright white light to wither and disintegrate until they are nothing but a pile of dark gray chunky ash. The angel will wander the map as the night grows darker, scaring off all other creatures that it does not kill. None are spared. As it wanders, it will emit a constant ticking sound that is audible to all units near it. A reminder to all that it hunts that their end is nearby. Luckily though, it possesses no senses beyond its rather limited cone of vision. Escaping a clockwork angel requires patience and awareness of its position to make it pass without getting caught in its deadly gaze. Anyways, before we speak about the next creature, 
Let me talk to you about that aforementioned facility layout that spawns relatively commonly on Hephaestus. Sometimes, when entering a facility, one will find that the door leads into a massive stone hallway. One that stretches far into the distance, with ceilings that are over a hundred feet tall. Littered on the scorched floors are pieces of valuable scrap that the employees can bring back home. High tier scrap is common here. The stone walls also occasionally have cracks in them that can lead into claustrophobic side tunnels so tight that only one employee at a time can fit inside. Sometimes it may even require that employee to crouch through tight spaces to reach pieces of wedged scrap. As the employees wander, they may notice that the layout is confusing. The tunnels, while large, aren't placed coherently. It's not a tunnel. It's a labyrinth. And they are not alone. They hear it first, the wails of a man made to sound like a screaming bull, but loud sounding more like a train horn filtered through a searing furnace. They hear loud footsteps echo down the halls as the noise gets further away, before approaching again. They see a bright orange light round corners at blazing speeds, before eventually it comes around again, and the employees come face to face with a beast known as the Blazing Minotaur. It's massive, far bigger than anything they've seen, barring maybe the Earth Leviathans. The creature is made of patched together skin mixed with pieces of metal. Atop the beast's head sits a statue of a bull's head made from lusterless bronze, from which sprouts thick black smoke and bright gouts of orange flame. The creature radiates heat and screams constantly in that distorted voice. It sprints down the hallway towards the employees, trampling one to paste instantly and barely missing the others as they duck into one of those aforementioned claustrophobic side tunnels to avoid the beast's wrath. But they know it will come around again. It is unknown if the Minotaur still has enough awareness in that boiling casket it calls ahead to know that the employees were there at all. But it doesn't truly matter what the beast once was. All that matters is getting the scrap and getting the hell out of there. The Blazing Minotaur is the only creature that can spawn in the labyrinth, and while incredibly deadly, knowledgeable employees can avoid its constant charging assaults with good awareness and knowledge of its patrol routes. But well, not all employees are so lucky as to be aware of the beast before they enter its domain, and far more get trampled and cooked before they even have a chance to scream. And that's all my concepts for this episode. Again, a massive thank you to the artists who helped me bring these ideas to life. If any insane fucker wants to mod in any of these ideas, feel free to. Just make sure to credit this video in the mod description. Anyways, make sure to check out all the artists. Tell me if you want to see more of these sorts of videos. I will always have more ideas. And I'll see you all in the next one. Bye bye <laughs>